She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signal's in my mind Forget to operate Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another Coffee and Crime Time. The case that we're talking about today actually happened or at least started back in 2012, but between then and now there have been multiple updates, uh, different legal battles, and finally a resolution that hopefully wraps everything up for good, and that resolution happened this past October of 2022. Now, considering the situation, considering how bad things got and how bad things could have been, I really think that the outcome we have at the end of the day is the best possible scenario given the situation. But of course, I want to talk about how we got there because this is a case that is the furthest thing from straightforward. Dr. Michael Weiss is a psychiatrist in New York City, and in 2012, he was living and working in Manhattan, not knowing that a plot to end his life was brewing behind the scenes. Now, Dr. Weiss would be very lucky and escape the worst of his attack, escape with his life at least. But what he realized in the aftermath about who was responsible and why he had been attacked only extended his fear and his trauma. Now, there's a lot to go over here, but before we dive in, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Native. There is a lot to love about Native, whether we're talking about their body wash, which I do all of the time because I really do love it, or their toothpaste, their body lotions. There's a lot to love. But today I want to talk about their deodorant, which is actually the product that made me first fall in love with Native. I love Native's deodorants because they work, because they make me smell good, and because they're made with simple and effective ingredients that I already know and already feel comfortable with, like coconut oil and shea butter. Native's deodorants are also aluminum and paraben-free. They are cruelty-free and vegan, and they also offer a sensitive deodorant range, which is also vegan, but made without baking soda. So for instance, this, this deodorant I have right here is a sensitive or in their sensitive range, and it's the scent Cotton and Lily, and they smell just as good. They work just as well. Both the original deodorant as well as the sensitive range will give you 72-hour odor protection and keep you smelling good all day long. And really, the formula is great too because it's non-crumbly, it's non-sticky, it's non-drying, and all you need is a few good swipes under your arms and you are set. Now, Native just launched a new collection. They launched their candy shop collection this month, January of 2023, and I have ordered it. I'm waiting for it to come in. I'm super excited. This collection of obnoxiously craveable candy shop inspired scents will help you satisfy your sweet tooth with an explosion of color fragrance, and fun with Native Spin on some of your favorites like gummy bears, sweet cinnamon hearts, sour berry belts, and strawberry vanilla taffy. Um, I, like I have said before, scent is so tied to memory, and what better to really like heal the inner child in you than to bring you back to your childhood, the best times of your childhood with these scents. And I have an order out right now. It hasn't come yet, but I want to try all of these. Specifically, I'm really looking forward to the gummy bear one and the strawberry vanilla 
Stella Taffy one. I know it's only January, but these kinds of colors and scents really makes me feel like spring's right around the corner. And I'm very much looking forward to weather warming up a little bit more and seeing some sun. But let's talk about the scents I do have with me right now that I love because I'm going to give you a code in a second for an amazing deal. And you're going to want to know which scents you should try. So first of all, citrus and herbal musk is my current favorite. If you follow me on Instagram, you know I pretty much bought Native out of this scent right before Christmas because I feel like every time I really love a scent and then I put it out into the world that I love that scent, Native sells out of that scent, okay? And then I can't get it. Like Cherry Vanilla Macaron, their limited edition scent that they had last year that I loved. And I was like, I love this scent. And then I went to go buy some more and it was all gone. So with the citrus and herbal musk, I was like, not today. I'm going to stock up before I put that out into the world. Now, eucalyptus and mint is also another great scent. And that is another one that I have recently had to restock on. And I'm waiting for that one to come in. I personally just really love those two scents, eucalyptus and mint together anytime. The whole smell feels very earthy and healing, so it is one of my favorite. And then, of course, sea salt and cedar will always have a place super close to my heart because, honestly, this is a great scent. It transports me to, like, the New England coast on an overcast morning with the waves crashing around me and the scent of rain in the air. Just super cozy, super fresh, just amazing. So, yeah, Native makes the best deodorants. This is my opinion, but also I'm always right. Native makes the best deodorants. They are the only deodorant I've used for years at this point. Their scents are always so amazing, clean, and never artificial smelling, which is amazing. You should definitely try Native out for yourself. Three deodorants are usually $39, but if you use the link in my description box and also use code STEPHANIEH28, you'll get them for $26. That's over 33% off. Also, with that same code, you can get 20% off any body wash or any lotion. So like my recommendation, get, get a couple deodorants, a couple few, get a couple few deodorants, which, by the way, they also have a plastic-free version of the deodorants as well. Same great formula inside with a more sustainable packaging that's earth-friendly and 100% plastic-free. So like I said, get some deodorants and then get the, the matching body wash scents and then walk around like the sweet-smelling angel that you are. Okay, once again, click the link in the description box. Use code Stephanie H 28 Get you some Native. Thank you so much to Native for sponsoring today's video. And let's dive in. The morning of November 12th, 2012, Dr. Michael Weiss got his four-year-old son Calder ready for the day, and then he dropped Calder off at daycare before returning to his West 57th Street home office in Manhattan to see a client for a therapy session. Michael Weiss loved his son, Calder. However, Michael's relationship with Calder's mother was less than ideal. Pamela Buckbinder was also a practicing psychiatrist in Manhattan, and although she and Michael had never been married, they had welcomed their first and only son into the world in 2008. After Calder was born, Michael and Pamela had continued to see each other and also continued to live together until July of 2009, at which point they had separated and Pamela and Calder moved into a different apartment in Greenwich Village. And in 2011, the estranged couple began the process of going to court to determine custody of Calder as well as visitation. And honestly, Pamela had not made it easy. During the custody battle, Pamela had attempted to turn her son against his father. She'd also made false claims about Michael, and she tried to get information about Michael's private life from their young son. But by November of 2012, both parties had entered into an agreement where they agreed to share joint legal custody, and Pamela retained residential custody, meaning that Calder would live with her full time, but Calder's father, Michael, would have regular parenting time, which included one overnight each week and then time as well every other weekend. Michael also agreed to pay child support, which he had been doing even before it was court ordered, but one of Pamela Buckbinder's stipulations as far as financial support went was that her ex, Michael Weiss, maintain a $1.5 million life insurance policy, which would name his son Calder as the irrevocable beneficiary and Calder's mother, Pamela, as the irrevocable trustee of that life insurance policy, which honestly should have been everyone's first red flag because you really never want to get to a point 
where you're worth more to someone dead than you are alive, especially when we're talking about an ex-girlfriend who clearly doesn't have the warmest feelings towards you. Like I said, they went to court to iron out custody and things like that in 2011, and they didn't settle on an agreement until the end of 2012. What does that tell you? This was a long, drawn-out most likely contentious process. Pamela being the irrevocable trustee of Michael Weiss's $1.5 million life insurance policy means that she would be the one to decide what happened with Michael's life insurance money forever, no matter what. And if Michael were to die while Calder was still too young to manage his own money, his mother Pamela would be able to spend that money for Calder, right? She couldn't technically say like, oh, I'm buying a new car for myself. She'd say, oh, well, I need to get Calder to daycare and I don't have a vehicle, so I'm buying this $100,000 car for Calder, you know, stuff like that. And honestly, the relationship between Michael Weiss and Pamela Buckbinder had been a roller coaster from day one, right? Full of ups and downs. They were on again and off again. They were fighting. They were lovey-dovey. I suppose you could say they were passionate, whether they were passionate about loving each other, whether they were passionate about hating each other, they were passionate. And during one of their on periods, or I guess maybe during the on period, but right before an off period, Pamela had actually been arrested after she had attacked Michael with a broken glass, which caused him to have to go to the hospital and get stitches. And Michael had also been arrested during their relationship after Pamela told the police that he had threatened to assault her. Now, keep in mind, I mean, this is very clear cut how I just said it, but some people might still kind of glaze over that. Michael Weiss had to go to the hospital and get stitched up because his girlfriend Pamela attacked him with a broken glass. Pamela accused Michael of threatening to harm her. There's no evidence on file, as far as I could tell, and I read through way too many court documents. There's no evidence on file that ever says Pamela had any proof that Michael hurt her, just that he had threatened to. Now, in both incidents, the broken glass incident and the he said he was going to hurt me incident, the charges were dropped or dismissed. But I think it's pretty clear that their dynamic was toxic. And Michael Weiss was probably ready to give Pamela whatever she wanted as long as it meant that he would be free of her. And so that's most likely why he agreed to this super sketchy life insurance uh, commitment deal kind of thing. And I mean, also, he probably didn't think um, that there was anything too nefarious in it, right? He most likely didn't think, hey, this lady's going to try to kill me. Who thinks that? Not a lot of people. But you should be thinking that. Once again, don't ever get to a point where you're worth more to someone dead than you are alive, right? Please, just try not to. So by November of 2012, when they'd ironed out this custody arrangement, when they'd agreed on this life insurance thing, things seemed to be working out. And Michael had just spent the night with his son, Calder. So it was starting out to be a good day. And Michael was feeling optimistic as he settled into his first therapy session of the day. However, midway through that session, he was interrupted by a handsome young man storming into his office and holding a large duffel bag. Now, this young man was 19-year-old Jacob Nolan, an intelligent and gifted teenager who came from a wealthy Long Island family, but who had also struggled with mental health issues since he'd been a child. Now, Jake was the third and youngest child to his parents, Jim and Debbie Nolan, and the Nolans claimed that Jake was a sweet kid, an absolute delight, so kind, not a mean bone in his body, and also so smart with a passion for inventing things like this iPhone study tool app that he'd co-created called FlashMe, which lets the user create and organize flashcards. But Jake had been diagnosed with ADHD when he was just five years old, and then his personality changed in his early teenage years. When he was about 15 years old, Jake began to have significant mood swings. And after he started missing school because he just didn't want to get out of bed in the morning, Jake was diagnosed with anxiety and depression. At the age of 17, Jake was hospitalized and diagnosed with bipolar disorder after he grabbed a knife from the kitchen and told his parents that he was taking it upstairs to his room at which point he planned to take his own life. 
By the time Jake started college, he'd been prescribed at least 30 different medications, but none of them seemed to be working. It didn't help that during college, Jake was also drinking alcohol and using illegal drugs. He was also not going to classes. So I do want to say something specific here because this is important to keep in mind. Oftentimes, when somebody does have a mental health illness like bipolar disorder, it is very important that they take their medication. Now, drinking alcohol and taking drugs, illegal drugs, while taking the medication can do one of two things. It can either interact with your uh, bipolar medication negatively, make it worse or, you know, make it less effective – Or um, when you're drinking alcohol and taking drugs, you're not being super responsible with your health, whether it be physical or mental health. So you may be not taking your medication or you may be taking it sporadically, not consistently. And with this type of medication, you really do need to be taking it consistently to see a consistent and positive effect. So whether the medications weren't working or Jake was not taking them as prescribed, we can't be sure. But what we are sure about is that Jake's parents, Jim and Debbie Nolan, they were at the end of their rope. They were worried to death about their gifted but sensitive child who just couldn't seem to get a foothold in the outside world, the real world. So when Debbie Cohen's niece, Pamela Buckbinder, offered to take her cousin Jake in and help him, it seemed like a gift from God, right? Pamela Buckbinder was, after all, a practicing, successful psychiatrist who saw and helped patients like Jake every single day. And she was family, so Jim and Debbie Cohen could trust her. And Jake trusted her, saying, quote, Pamela and I had formed a relationship when I was really young. This is my cousin. This is someone I really knew. And I entrust everything into this one woman. I mean, this woman is going to save my life, end quote. And the timing could not have been more perfect for both parties. Jake needed a change of scenery, and Pamela was living as a single mother. Pamela offered to let Jake live with her. Uh, She would also give him regular therapy sessions and monitor his medications as long as he would help her care for her four-year-old son, Calder. Jim and Debbie Cohen were encouraged when their son Jake seemed to transform for the better after living in his cousin's New York City apartment and forming a bond with his cousin Pamela and with her son Calder. Now, when Jake had moved in, Pamela asked him to be Calder's godfather, and this was a huge responsibility for Jake, but it also gave him a purpose. Jake had been feeling really down and negatively about himself. He felt that no matter how much he tried, he couldn't do anything right. So to know that someone entrusted him with the most precious thing in their life, that made him feel that maybe he did have value and maybe he could be a productive member of society. And taking care of Calder became Jake's number one priority and, in a way, a major part of his identity. And later, Jake would say, quote, This was a kid that I loved more than my life. End quote. Now, looking at it logically, making Jake the godfather of her son, and I use this very like loosely saying making Jake the godfather of her son, but this was most likely Pamela's first step in, you know, manipulation, right? Because if you think about it, <laughs> By the time you're four years old, you you should already have a godfather because you would already usually be baptized. I mean, anybody who's practicing the kind of religion where they believe in having a godfather, and I know there's going to be people in the comments who are like, oh, and there's the exception to every rule. I know. <laughs> Some people get baptized when they're 89 years old. I know. But if you're somebody who practices regularly, any kind of religion that godparents are involved in, typically what's going to happen is you're going to get your child baptized, you know, three, four months after they're born. Some people do it right away, depending on the religion, once again. And at that time, at the time of the baptism, uh, you're already going to know who the godparents are. And typically any religious organization is going to want you to tell them who the godparents are at this point. So in my opinion, Pamela asking Jake to be Calder's godfather by the time Calder was four years old, it was an empty gesture on her part. It meant the world to him, but for her, she was just doing it to, you know, basically say, oh, look how important you are. Look at this responsibility I'm giving you. When in reality, she probably didn't actually consider Jake to be Calder's true godfather. It was just an empty gesture 
to manipulate him, to place trust in his hands. But it was a shallow trust. It wasn't like an actual um, trusting gesture. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? I hope so. So when Jake barged into Michael Weiss's office on that day, they weren't strangers to each other. Michael knew Jake through his ex-girlfriend, Pamela. And in a way, he was kind of used to him already, right? Like, he knew him. There's a video of Michael and Pamela at, at Jake's bar mitzvah and, you know, congratulating him and things like that. So he already knew him. He was also aware of his mental health struggles. And as a practicing psychiatrist, Michael knew how to handle people like Jake or patients like Jake. So Michael patiently and calmly asked Jake to leave his office so he could finish the therapy session that he was in the process of. And then when Michael's client left, he went out into the hallway and found Jake sort of like hanging around in the hallway outside, still waiting. Jake told Michael that he was there for physical copies of financial aid documents for Calder's preschool. And so Michael invited Jake inside his office, telling him, listen, just like hang out here. I'm going to retrieve those documents. But he did ask Jake to leave his duffel bag that he was holding outside in the hallway because Michael was concerned that Jake had equipment, like recording equipment in that duffel bag. And Michael was concerned that Jake was going to use this recording equipment that he thought he might have inside the duffel bag to bug the office where Michael worked. And this office that Michael worked was also in the apartment that he lived in. So Michael Weiss lives on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. He has an apartment which also functions as his home office where he sees patients. And Michael was worried about this because he'd been dealing with Pamela's antics for too long. And so he wasn't trying to second guess Jake's motives for being there that day. He was going to take him at face value like, okay, you need these papers. I'll go get them for you. But if you are here for some ulterior motive, like could you leave your duffel bag out in the hallway? Now, it doesn't really make a lot of sense because Jake ended up not leaving the duffel bag out in the hallway. It, we don't really ever get it explained to us what happened there. Maybe Jake refused. Maybe he just walked in with the duffel bag and Michael didn't check to see if he'd actually left the duffel bag outside. Also, if Jake was going to bug the office, he could have, you know, um, the, the recording devices in his jacket or in his pocket. So maybe when Jake was like, no, I'm not leaving my duffel bag out in the hallway, Michael Weiss was like, all right, whatever. I guess I'm just going to have to like bring somebody in here and sweep for bugs after you leave. But really, generally, Michael was only concerned about this happening or Jacob being there for nefarious reasons because Pamela had already recorded several of her calls with Michael in an attempt to use them against him in court. So he didn't really want to take any chances. Michael Weiss was on his guard at this point, but he never could have guessed in a million years what was actually in that duffel bag that Jake clutched in his hand. Once inside the office, duffel bag still in hand, Jake asked to use Michael's bathroom. And so he goes in the bathroom and then he emerged a few moments later. But at that point, he was wielding a 10-pound sledgehammer, which he swung at Michael Weiss's head. Luckily, Michael was quick on his feet. He saw it coming, and he was able to move out of the way and dodge the worst of the blow. But the hammer still hit Michael in his shoulder, which stunned him momentarily. Jake, at that point, discarded the sledgehammer. I think he probably didn't realize like how heavy a 10-pound sledgehammer was. Like If you're swinging it, you're not going to be super accurate in your swings, especially if you're not used to kind of, you know, swinging around heavy things. And I don't think that that Jacob Nolan was somebody who was like really lifting weights <laughs> in the gym, you know, so I think he just didn't really um, kind of go through that whole process and understand that he couldn't be as accurate with this heavy sledgehammer as he wanted to be. But just because he tossed the sledgehammer to the side, it did not mean that that Jake was retreating. Jake also had a knife in his duffel bag, so he pulled that out and he used it to now wildly stab Michael Weiss repeatedly in the arms, in the legs, in the back, in the chest, in the stomach. I think Michael was stabbed something like seven to nine times, but Michael was also not going out without a fight. And he was much bigger and much stronger than Jake. Michael Weiss stood at six foot three. He weighed in at 205 pounds, and he was able to wrestle that knife out of Jake's hands. And he stabbed back, hitting Jake above the collarbone. 
Now, for a moment, Michael Weiss glanced at the knife in his hand, now covered in not only his blood, but Jake's blood. And then he had the sick realization that he recognized the knife. It came from a set of knives that he had bought for his ex-girlfriend, Pamela Buckbinder, when they had still lived together. Michael, who was badly injured, began screaming for help, and his 19-year-old attacker, Jake, he clutched his own wound, stumbled out into the hallway, and at that point, when Jake stumbled out into the hallway, residents who were, like, in the building had already begun to, like, gather because they had heard uh, the screaming and the fighting. Michael Weiss also managed to crawl out into the hallway after Jake Nolan, where he then passed out next to where his attacker, Jake, was sitting in the hallway. 911 calls began to flood in from people who had heard the attack and who had seen the aftermath, and confused neighbors watched as Jake Nolan took his cell phone out and snapped a selfie. And then he began to text someone furiously on his cell phone. Jake was texting his cousin, Pamela Buckbinder. When the first responders arrived, Jake pointed at Michael Weiss and simply said, he stabbed me. So understand, Michael Weiss is like passed out by this time. He can't say anything. Jake's first story is that Michael attacked him. But when the police arrived based on what they saw and what they what they collected at the scene, they kind of came up with a completely different story based on, you know, the evidence. They recovered the sledgehammer and the kitchen knife that Jake had used to attack Michael, a kitchen knife that was also found to be missing from the knife rack at Pamela Buckbinder's house or apartment. They also collected Jacob's duffel bag into evidence, and inside that bag there was a pack of cigarettes, plastic zip ties, a Home Depot bag, two pillows, and a hand-drawn map of Michael Weiss's building with its two separate entrances marked and noted, as well as lines drawn to illustrate how one would get from one side of the lobby to the other. Now, the location of Michael's apartment slash home office on the 11th floor was also marked on this map. Now, they took the shopping bag, the Home Depot shopping bag, and this led police to the West 23rd Street Home Depot store in Chelsea, where they were then able to recover surveillance footage from the night before. And this footage showed Jake purchasing a sledgehammer and plastic zip ties. But Jake was not alone at that Chelsea Home Depot. While Michael Weiss had been enjoying his once-a-week overnight with his four-year-old son, his ex-girlfriend Pamela had been paying cash for a sledgehammer that would be used the very next day by her cousin in an attempt to murder him. Not murder her cousin, murder Michael Weiss. That sentence was phrased weirdly when I said it. Both Jacob Nolan and Michael Weiss were transported to the hospital and treated. Now, Michael would be stitched up and eventually allowed to go home, but Jake would be arrested for attempted murder. He spent four days in the hospital recovering before being taken into police custody, at which point he was charged and then released on a $200,000 bail, at which point he was allowed to fly home to his parents who were living in Miami at that time. Now listen, I kept reading this, like his parents were living in Miami. He was, he had spent time in Miami, but I was confused because it kept saying, um, in all the newspaper articles that Jake was from Long Island, that he was from a wealthy Long Island family, which, I mean, let's be honest, was why he was able to pay for his bail to begin with. But I was confused, and I was like, is there a Miami in New York? Or are they talking about Miami, Florida? I couldn't figure it out. And what I guess I've come to terms with is, like, there is no Miami in New York. There's a Miami River but that's in like upstate, kind of closer to where I live, not in the city or not near Long Island. So what I think is is going on here is Jake Nolan's parents' family were from Long Island, but at some time they relocated to Miami, Florida, or they owned property in Long Island and also owned property in Miami, Florida. And in November, when this attack happened, they just so happened to be in Miami, most likely because they're like snowbirds. You know, do you know what snowbirds are? I used to work at Verizon, so I always had um, snowbirds coming in. Basically, snowbirds are, you know, older or retired people who, you know, may live on the East Coast, but then during the winter 
uh, season, they go to warmer climates like Florida or even like the Bahamas or something like that. And they own property there and they spend the the bad winter season in, in nice tropical conditions while we all suffer because we are not snowbirds yet. One day, one day I will be a snowbird. So what I really legitimately think happened here, correct me if anybody knows and correct me if I'm wrong, because there is no Miami in New York that I could find. I just couldn't find it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but what I think happened here is 19-year-old Jacob Nolan attacked Michael Weiss with a sledgehammer and then stabbed him like eight times. He got bailed out, and then they were like, yeah, it's totally okay for you to leave the state and go to Florida while you wait for your trial. Is that what I'm, is that what I'm hearing here? That's what happened, right? Okay. Definitely. And allegedly and reportedly, while Jacob was out on bail waiting for his trial, which I, I don't believe happened for like several years, by the way, um, but while he was waiting for his trial, he was really struggling with his mental health. He was feeling very badly about what he had attempted to do. And he did also, again, try to take his own life. His lawyer makes it seem like he made several attempts to do this. Once again, this is just what's reported. I don't have like doctor's proof or, you know, doctor's reports or evidence from hospitals saying that this is what happened. This is just what Jake, his parents, and his lawyer say. I don't know if it's true or not. I'm just telling you what was reported. And I'm going to zip this up because it keeps hitting the desk and it's really annoying. I'm just going to come right out with it and tell you that Jake Nolan would eventually point the finger at his cousin Pamela, claiming that the whole murder plot to end Michael Weiss's life was her idea. He claimed that Pamela had brainwashed him into murdering her ex, but I, I do also want to say that that Jake Nolan didn't make this claim until a few weeks after his arrest. In fact, he initially told police that he'd been acting in self-defense, that he'd gone into Michael's office to get these papers, the financial aid documents for Calder's preschool, and it was Michael who had, like, grabbed the sledgehammer out of Jake's duffel bag and, like, swung on him first. Which doesn't make any sense because it's like, how did Michael know that you had a sledgehammer in your duffel bag? And also, why? Why do you have a sledgehammer in your duffel bag? Like, who's walking around with a sledgehammer and a kitchen knife in a big-ass duffel bag without some sort of, like, nefarious bad intentions, right? I don't know. So basically... The prosecutors, the state, they weren't buying this story. They weren't buying, A, that Michael had swung on Jake first and Jake was acting in self-defense. And they also weren't buying the fact that Pamela had manipulated or brainwashed Jake into trying to murder someone. They just believed that Jacob Nolan was failing to take accountability for his own actions. But even before... Jake would step into a courtroom for a criminal trial. He and Pamela were actually both sued by Michael Weiss in a civil court in November of 2013. Michael claimed that Pamela had basically forced him into making her the trustee of his $1.5 million life insurance policy. And then she and her cousin Jacob hatched a plan to kill him four days later so that they could collect the money. Now, keep in mind also... Jacob Nolan claims he had no idea about this insurance policy. And I do kind of believe him. I, I believe he had no idea about this insurance policy. And actually, considering the fact that Jake Nolan came from money and seemed to kind of have access to as much money as he needed and or wanted, I don't see how money could be a motive for him. And because that life insurance policy, that $1.5 million life insurance policy, was put into action and kind of decided on, so shortly before the attempted murder, I do believe that he didn't know about it. Now, as evidence that it was Pamela who was running the whole show, Michael's lawyer, Roland Acevedo, brought in a forensic expert to testify that Pamela was the one who had drawn the map for Jake, the map that showed him exactly how to get into Michael's apartment building and then where to go once he was inside. They also showed that it was Pamela who had purchased the sledgehammer using the Home Depot surveillance camera. And through cell phone records, they were also able to show that Jake and Pamela had been in contact before the attempted murder 
and directly afterwards. So remember, Jake had taken a picture of himself, like a selfie of himself all bloody in the hallway outside of Michael's apartment slash office. And he had texted Pamela from the hallway outside of Michael's office. He said at that point he'd been checking in with her, letting her know that the plan had failed and that he had been injured. Pamela didn't respond to that message, but soon after, Jake would text her again from the hospital saying, quote, in hospital, please come. Michael bleeding badly. Same. I walked into office. He stabbed me with knife in the heart. End quote. And Pamela, she did respond, but she didn't respond back with alarm. She didn't ask, you know, Jake, what happened? Like, what are you talking about? What? This is crazy. You know, she didn't immediately call him. She simply responded, where? And then she went to the hospital to check on him. Later, Jake Nolan would say, quote, there was no plan for after the attack. I think it was Pamela's plan to just dismiss me and like, oh, well, he tried to kill him. He lost, you know, try again later. I really believe it was her plan to try again, end quote. A family court judge, Monica Shulman, ended up barring all visitation between Pamela and her son after hearing this evidence and believing that Pamela had been involved with scheming to have Michael Weiss killed. Judge Shulman said, quote, her, meaning Pamela's, overall belief that it was appropriate to deprive this child of his father's guidance and affection can only be viewed as evidencing the mother's utter indifference to this child's well-being, end quote. Also, I mean, probably a sign of an unstable person, right? The willingness to take a life because you either want money or just want complete custody and control of this child that you share, that's a red flag to me. A red flag of someone who probably isn't safe for a kid to be around, you know, like, yeah, her, Pamela trying to, like, have Michael Weiss killed and not considering, like, I'm taking my child's father away from him. Like, yes, that is, that's cold and callous. But just the fact that you would try to kill someone to get your own way is like, you know, disturbing. So I think that's also a red flag of why Pamela probably should not have access to her child. The weird thing was, even though Jake had made these claims that his cousin Pamela was involved with the murder plan, even though he pointed the finger at her within weeks of his arrest, she was not arrested. She did not immediately lose custody of her child or, you know, even have her custody called into question. Her medical license wasn't even put in jeopardy. And although Pamela did end up closing her psychiatric practice in her office in New York City, she did so because of bad publicity, because the story was in the news and stuff, not because she was forced to. I am sure she ended up closing it because people were like, why do I need to go and get mental health help from a psychiatrist who is clearly herself not right in the head, right? I mean, and and I think that there's like an old joke, like uh, psychiatrists all always have therapists, you know, they always need their own mental health professional because, you know, maybe sometimes psychiatrists are like the craziest ones of us all. Like actually mental health professionals always make these jokes amongst themselves. Like we're the most like mentally unwell people. And I don't think it's a funny joke to make personally because one, I don't think that mental health is something that you should be making jokes about. And and I'm pretty like laid back when it comes to humor and stuff. But I just feel like Maybe being like, haha, I'm not right. You know, I have so many issues. I'm so damaged. I don't think it's something that you should be taking lightly. If you are a mental health professional yourself and, you know, maybe it's just like workplace humor, like they got to laugh about it or they'll cry about it. But I also do think that there is something to be said for the person that you are going to see for help fixing whatever is broken inside of you. They should probably already like be fixed themselves. Like maybe they already went through some stuff. Maybe they struggled with mental health issues, which makes it easier for them to relate to you. But by the time you are sitting in front of them (laughs) and they are like helping you work through stuff and giving you advice, they should probably be like whole and, and like, you know, really moving towards their own mental health, like wholeness, right? It just doesn't feel safe to me that Pamela Buckbinder was actively seeing patients at the same time that she was giving her own cousin therapy lessons during which she was like brainwashing him and manipulating him into attacking her ex-boyfriend so that she could collect 
his insurance money and not have to share custody with him. Like it seems it, it seems so wrong. It makes me feel super, super uncomfortable. So the whole dynamic of Jacob Nolan being arrested and then Jake saying like, listen, I did do this. I, I admit it, obviously, <laughs> you know, you caught me red handed. However, my cousin Pamela, who's a psychiatrist, who's also Michael Weiss's ex-girlfriend, who also has a financial motive to see him gone, who was also giving me therapy, you know, during which I am this in this fragile mental health state and she is responsible for what could be, you know, going into my head. She had something to do with this. And for the police and the district attorney and everybody to just ignore it, and at least from the outside, nobody to see any movement on this, nobody to see Pamela being brought in, being arrested, being charged, being put on trial herself. They didn't even call her to testify during Jake Nolan's criminal trial. This was very confusing for a lot of people, especially Michael Weiss, the victim, who had no doubt that what Jake was claiming was 100% true because he knew his ex-girlfriend. He knew Pamela. He knew how she could be a little bit, you know, unhinged. Michael Weiss's lawyer, Ronald Acevedo, said, quote, my client is concerned about the safety and well-being of his child, and that's why he filed an action in family court. We assumed that shortly after the incident, the responsible parties would be prosecuted and appropriate action would be taken. Now that this has not happened nearly two years later, my client has been forced to seek relief in another forum, end quote. So yeah, within two years, not only had Jacob Nolan not gone on trial yet for the attempted murder, Pamela had not been arrested, had not been detained, and Michael Weiss is still having to share custody with her, right? She still has residential custody of their son. Now, some people might say, well, that doesn't have anything to do with anything. You know, just because Pamela tried to kill Michael, allegedly, um, it doesn't mean she's going to hurt hurt the, her son. And like, yes, it, do, it definitely does not um, automatically mean that, right? But if you look at a situation like Susan Powell, so for those of you who don't know about this case, I have, I believe, two or three videos on Susan Powell. Susan Powell was um, a woman who was married to a man named Josh Powell. Josh Powell is a banana split Sunday, or was a banana split Sunday with extra nuts. Um, he was Mormon, very religious, off his rocker, and Susan Powell disappeared. Now, we definitely 1 million percent believe that Josh Powell killed Susan and hid her remains. She still has not been found to this day. But after she disappeared and while Josh Powell was a suspect in her disappearance and, you know, murder, basically, the the kids that they shared together, the two young sons they shared together, were removed from his custody, but he was allowed to have visitation. Um, they stopped visitation for a while because they were concerned about the kids, but then they did allow him to have visitation again. And the second that the social worker dropped these two kids off to Josh Powell, Josh locked himself and his boys inside of the house, and then he killed his children and himself and set the house on fire. So when you look at something like that, yeah, just because Josh Powell made his wife disappear doesn't mean he's going to hurt his sons, but there's a chance that he could because if you are willing to take somebody's life, then you really, it's not, you know, there's no saying what you can be capable of doing, right? So I completely understand how two years after you believe your ex-girlfriend orchestrated your attempted murder and she still has full custody of your kid, you're stressed out and worrying every single day. So let's go back to Jacob Nolan's claims that he only attacked Michael Weiss because he had been brainwashed by Pamela, a manipulation that he claimed began the moment he started living with her when she gave him the prestigious title of, you know, Calder's godfather and made him feel valued and important. From there, Pamela really brought Jake into her home, into her life, and into her family. And considering that they were cousins, you know, like blood cousins, first cousins, Pamela did this in a somewhat creepy and, in my opinion, icky way, um, sort of by making, making Jake, her cousin, a proxy partner, a proxy husband, a proxy father to her son Calder, like a proxy partner to her, a proxy husband to her, and a proxy father to her son Calder. Um, we see this a lot, actually, in in situations where um, two parents have issues with each other and they're fighting a lot and the mother will sometimes take her son as a proxy husband and put this, like, level of emotional 
uh, baggage and burden on him. And, and, you know, the son will then feel like he has to be his mother's caretaker. Once again, I have another series where we discuss this this kind of dynamic, and it is the Andrew Cunanan series, The Assassination of Gianni Versace. One of the my best series, I think, to date, the one that I really enjoyed doing the most because it was very interesting to get into the mind and the life of Andrew Cunanan, who was the person that, that not only killed Gianni Versace, but also killed um, a few other young men. So it, it does do a psychological number on somebody like Jacob Nolan and Andrew Cunanan when you have this older woman who is putting this emotional burden on you and also making you feel that you are an important person in her life, that you are there to take care of her and support her and all of these things. And remember, they were cousins. So we have to remember to look at things through the lens of Pamela and Jake not only being cousins, which makes it creepy and icky enough, but Pamela also being her cousin Jake's psychiatrist, right? Giving him regular therapy sessions, being in charge of his medications, as well as his overall mental health well-being. That's why Jacob came to live with her in the first place. She was supposed to help him get better. She was supposed to be there for him as a 24-7 built-in mental health professional to guide him through this incredibly rocky time in his life when nothing else was working. So this is messed up, like, right? It's messed up on all accounts. For Pamela to have Jacob, her cousin, be like a proxy husband to her, a proxy father to Calder, and then also being his mental health professional at the same time, a trusted advisor as far as his mental health well-being goes, it's very, very toxic, bad situation. For instance, a picture has surfaced of Pamela, Jake, and little Calder all in bed together. And when you look at this picture and you don't know who these people are to each other, you're like, this is completely natural and normal. This is something that a couple might do with their child, you know, spend a couple minutes cuddling in bed together uh, in the morning before the day starts really connecting, um, you know, the, the power of touch, the power of love. You would understand why like a, a couple and their child might do that. But when you look at that picture and understand the dynamics, it's hard to understand why someone like Pamela who is an older woman, a psychiatrist, a respected psychiatrist, why she would do that with her younger cousin who was depending on her for mental health guidance. Jake was 19 years old at this time, and Pamela was 40. She was his cousin and his therapist. Now, when asked about this picture and the implications behind it, Jake said, quote, I guess that just goes to show you the level of comfort that I really felt there. It was not unusual in the morning for her to invite me into bed with Calder and I and to share that familial moment, you know, really feel like a family together, end quote. Ugh, so creepy. Like, I don't know, man, maybe, maybe I'm being like judgmental and some of y'all have relationships with your first cousins who are of the opposite sex from you where you feel completely fine snuggling in bed together. Um, and if that is the case, I'm very sorry if I'm offending you, but I find it to be wholly unnatural. So Dr. Sasha Bardet, who is a psychiatrist that examined Jake on behalf of his defense team, Dr. Bardet claimed that this was further manipulation from Pamela. Pamela was going to get what she wanted from Jake by giving Jake what he desired more than anything. Dr. Bardet said, quote, Jake wants a normal life. He wants to be a successful, respected family man with a nuclear family and a happy life, end quote. And it completely makes sense, right? As somebody who um, has struggled with mental health issues, I, I made it sound like I was talking about me. But I, I mean, I was talking about Jake. I have also struggled with mental health issues. But for Jake, as somebody who struggled with mental health issues and kind of never felt like he had a place, never felt like he fit in, when he has the opportunity to have a place and to fit in, it's going to feel very impactful for him. And Jake's father, Jim Nolan, claimed that as far as he knew, there had been nothing sexual or romantic between his son and Pamela. It was all like mental manipulation. But, I mean... <laughs> There may have been something, maybe if not physical, something emotionally romantic about their relationship because Pamela was also sending Jake texts that would be far more appropriate to send to a partner than a family member. So Pamela would text Jake and call him cute little nicknames like Lovey and Sweet Jay. You know, reportedly she was sending him texts saying things like, I find you to be the most beautiful, like remarkable, brilliant person that I've ever met. And she would say things like, oh, I think about you. 
um, all, all day today or I think about you a lot when we're not together. I miss you when we're apart. You know, things like that. I think one text that was reported was Pamela saying to Jake like, oh, I have so many thoughts of you throughout the day. But Pamela also had other thoughts, thoughts about her ex, Michael Weiss, and how much she hated him. And she would tell Jake how much she hated Michael and why she hated Michael. Allegedly, Pamela told Jake that Michael was sexually abusing their son Calder. Pamela also said that Michael had abused her in the past, and she also said that he was refusing to pay child support. Now, as far as we know, none of these allegations were true. We know that Michael was paying child support. We know that there's no evidence that he was abusing Pamela. And I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the whole um, sexual abuse allegations as far as Calder was concerned were complete lies. You'll see this. This is very common during divorces or splits and custody hearings. One parent sometimes will coax or coach the child to make claims of abuse or sexual abuse against the other parent simply so that they can get their way. But Jake would have no way of knowing that these things weren't true. He wouldn't suspect that his cousin and therapist was lying to him in an effort to turn him against Michael. Why would she do that? And, you know, obviously, Pamela wanted Jake to think that Michael was a danger to four-year-old Calder, who Jake had grown very protective of. Now, in November of 2012, Jake claimed that Pamela told him that Michael Weiss was refusing to complete the financial aid papers she needed to enroll Calder in preschool. According to Jake, Pamela would tell him these things over and over again every single day. It was like constant, just constantly talking shit about Michael Weiss, saying the most horrid things about him um, to the point where it was just like being pounded into his head that the Michael Weiss was a very bad and dangerous person. Jacob Nolan later said, quote, I would have done anything for Pamela. It happens so slowly that you don't really recognize this growing feeling inside of you, that one day you wake up and say, I'll kill for this woman, end quote. And for Jacob Nolan, that day that he woke up and said, I'll kill for this woman, was November 12th, 2012, the day he took a sledgehammer and attacked his cousin's ex-boyfriend. Now, Jake claims that Pamela woke him up that morning by crawling into bed with him, rubbing his back, and telling him how much she loved him. That morning, Pamela told Jake that he was the greatest person ever, her savior, and that no one else besides Jake understood her. According to Jake, by this time, they'd already planned the sledgehammer attack. They'd purchased the weapon, the sledgehammer, the night before at Home Depot, which we've seen from the surveillance footage. And Jake said, quote, she had already told me that she wanted me to hit him over the head, playing Maxwell's silver hammer by the Beatles repeatedly in the house, end quote. However, Jake also claimed that his cousin Pamela had further plans in mind that he was not 100% on board for. Jake said, quote, Pamela was determined for me to, you know, torture Michael before killing him. She wanted me to inject him with some poisonous chemicals. She wanted to burn him alive in front of a group of people, end quote. Damn. If that's true, Pamela's a truly twisted individual. Like, she really hated Michael Weiss and was truly twisted. If her idea of justice or her idea of an appropriate death for her ex was to have him burned alive in front of a group of people. So basically like like a, a witch trial in public, in the public square. Now this claim that Jake would make, that uh, Pamela wanted him to torture Michael, that claim would catch up to him later when he would be put on trial for attempted murder and he and his legal team would argue diminished capacity, claiming that Pamela took advantage of Jake's fragile and submissive mental health. In a legal landscape, diminished capacity is often used as opposed to like the defense of not guilty by reasons of insanity because the diminished capacity plea is based on the belief that certain people because of mental impairment or disease are simply incapable of reaching the mental state required to commit a particular crime. Like for me, the thing that the case that comes to mind is the murder of Harvey Milk uh, back in the day. I think it was like the 80s or even the 70s. And the person who murdered him in, in trial or in court, his lawyer would use what, what we now call the Twinkie defense, basically saying that because this guy, the um, suspect, had eaten so much junk food his brain like wasn't working properly, so it was diminished capacity. <laughs> it's the Twinkie defense. Look it up. It's crazy. The defense team couldn't very well say that Jake was innocent of the act once again. 
he was caught red-handed, but they could say that he had a weak and susceptible psyche and he had been indoctrinated by a trusted adult who was also acting as his doctor, somebody in a position of credibility and power and trust. Now, we'll talk more about that in a bit, but let's go back to the morning of November 12th as Dr. Michael Weiss was dropping his son off at daycare. Pamela Buckbinder was packing a duffel bag of weapons for her cousin. Jake said that Pamela was crying hysterically as she put the sledgehammer and kitchen knife into the duffel bag, and he claims that she looked at him, tears streaming down her face, and told him, quote, Today is the day. Life is going to be so much better after Michael is terminated. End quote. Jake then took the duffel bag and the map that Pamela had drawn from him of Michael's building, and he entered the building through the business entrance. You can see him on surveillance. He was making no effort to hide his face or disguise his appearance. And when he signed in with security, he signed in with his real name. And he told them that he was there to visit Bright Kids NYC, a tutoring center located in the same building. Later, when asked why he didn't disguise himself or use a fake name, Jake would say, quote, I signed in with my own name. Remember, I was willing to die for this woman. I wasn't trying to hide anything. End quote. From there, Jake traveled up to um, Dr. Michael Weiss's apartment slash uh, home office, walked in in the middle of a therapy session, a scenario we already saw from Michael's perspective at the beginning of this video. Now, at this point, Jake claimed he was an emotional wreck. He said he was really nervous, and he thinks he even wanted to back out at this point, but he also said he didn't really feel that he had the ability to do so. He said, quote, Because I couldn't go back to Pamela without this done. I felt like I had no choice, end quote. Now, we know you always have a choice, right? I understand that Jake probably felt pressure, like I'm living with this person and I owe a lot to her. I can't go back to her if I don't do this. But he still did have a place to go back to if he didn't do that, right? He could have said, screw this, dropped the sledgehammer, told Michael Weiss, dude, your, your, your ex is trying to kill you and went home to his parents, okay, who loved him and who could have gotten him a, a true mental health professional who wouldn't try to, like, manipulate him and brainwash him into, to, you know, att- attempting to kill somebody and, and landing in prison. Because honestly, I mean, for Pamela Buckbinder, things were never going to pan out well for Jacob Nolan, right? He was either going to get attacked and killed by Michael Weiss, a man who was bigger and taller and stronger than him, or he was going to successfully murder Michael Weiss and then get arrested and go to prison. There was no scenario where Jake Nolan was going to go home to her and then they were just going to walk off into the sunset hand in hand and live happily ever after. There was no instance where that was going to happen. Jacob Nolan was caught on surveillance camera all over that building. She knew what was going to happen to him. I mean, for all we know, she had plans that if Jacob Nolan made it back to her apartment in one piece, that she was going to you know, kill him and then say he he took his own life because he had a history of doing so. Or she was going to, you know, kill him and say that he came home and tried to attack her as well. Who knows what she would have done, but there was no way that Jacob Nolan was walking out of this in one piece and living happily ever after with Pamela and Calder as one big happy family, which is what he thought I think was going to happen. Jacob Nolan went on trial for the attempted murder of Michael Weiss in March of 2016. And as we had already briefly discussed, by this time, Pamela Buckbinder had not been arrested or charged with any crime, even though Jake's defense would be that his cousin planned and facilitated the attack on the father of her son. Now, for the purposes of the trial, Jake was examined by two mental health experts, Dr. Sasha Bardet for the defense and Dr. Jason Hirschberger for the prosecution. And of course, no surprise here, the doctors came up with two different opinions. Dr. Bardet put forth his theory that Pamela, who was a psychiatrist, knew exactly how to manipulate the mind of her cousin, eventually transforming him into a weapon that she controlled. However, during Jake's interview with the prosecution psychiatrist, Dr. Hirschberger, Jake claimed that Pamela wanted him to torture Michael, to cut off his balls, and Jake refused to do that. So Dr. Hirschberger was like, well, why did you refuse? You know, was that a line too far for you? And Jake agreed, yes, that was a line too far for me because I'd never hurt anyone before. And Dr. Hirschberger saw this as evidence that Jake did have some choice in the matter. He was willing to kill Michael, but he was also able to draw the line at torture, which showed that he was exhibiting free will of some sort. He wasn't just a puppet blindly following whatever Pamela Buckbinder told him to do. Because if what Jake is saying is true, he was told by Pamela to torture Michael and to make it as painful as possible. And the presence of the zip ties in the duffel bag kind of support that and back that up. 
and he decided not to do that. So he was with it enough to make the decision to not do something that he was uncomfortable with. Now, Jake's lawyer, Stephen Brownstein, claimed that Jake was not the one with the motive to see Michael Weiss dead. It was Pamela who would benefit the most from Michael no longer being around. Not only would she be in control of $1.5 million, but she'd no longer have to share custody of her child with a man that she vehemently hated. Unfortunately for Jacob Nolan, the jury agreed with the prosecution. They came back with a guilty verdict after only 50 minutes of deliberating. Michael Weiss actually spoke at Jake's sentencing, saying that he had no personal desire to see Jake punished too harshly. And Michael Weiss said, quote, I understand that a long prison sentence will not undo what has happened or restore the sense of security that has been forever taken from me, end quote. Michael made it clear that although he believed Jake was somewhat responsible, he also believed the majority of the responsibility lay with Pamela Buckbinder, who you know, Michael Weiss agreed, had manipulated and used Jake for her own means. Jacob Nolan was sentenced to nine and a half years for the attempted murder of Michael Weiss, while Pamela Buckbinder continued to walk free. But that would change the year after Jake's trial when Pamela was arrested at a friend's house just outside of Syracuse, New York, on October 19th, 2017. At that point, she was charged with second-degree attempted murder and first-degree attempted assault. She pleaded not guilty, to both charges. Now, I guess the whole process of trying to locate Pamela in order to arrest her was kind of a shit show as well, because it turned out that, you know, Pamela didn't actually live at any of the Manhattan addresses that she'd given the police. So they went to all of these, I think she gave them like three addresses in New York City, and they went to all of them. And She maybe had been there at one point or she'd never been there, but she wasn't there when they were trying to find her to arrest her. On October 20th, 2017, when Pamela pleaded not guilty before Justice Thomas Farber, the same judge who had presided over her cousin's trial and sentencing, the prosecution argued to the judge, like, listen, we know that, you know, she's going to ask for bail, but we believe she's a flight risk. We don't feel comfortable having her, you know, get out on bail. The prosecution said that Pamela's lawyers had made several offers to bring her in and to have her surrender, but the police had been trying to locate her for three weeks prior to her arrest, and each address they visited, they found that she no longer lived at. So they had to eventually track her phone, at which point they discovered she'd been moving around quite a bit from locations in Massachusetts, where she reportedly owned property, to Fayetteville, New York, which is the location outside of Syracuse, where she was eventually apprehended and arrested. Now, when she was arrested, Pamela was also in possession of a few things that made the prosecution feel she was planning to run. She had her passport, as well as her birth certificate, and she was also also in possession of her son Calder's passport, although that passport had recently expired. Another thing to keep in mind is Fayetteville, New York, is only two hours from the Canadian border. So she's kind of right there. And like, listen, I live, um, you know, pretty close to Fayetteville, not like super close, but I'm familiar with the area. I live very close to the Canadian border. I live closer to Canada than New York City. And I do agree that it is suspicious when people be moving closer to the border when they know they're about to get arrested and they have their passport on them. And prosecutors argued that they believed Pamela had been trying to get out of the country, knowing that law enforcement was closing in. Pamela also had a good deal of financial assistance available to her, even though she had shut down her psychiatric practice and she was not working at that time. It turns out that Pamela also came from some money, and because of her family money, she would have been able to post a $1 million bail, which would be secured by $1.6 million in real estate, and her mother was also willing to put up her own Florida home as collateral. After the arrest of Pamela Buckbinder, District Attorney Cyrus Vance Jr. said, Quote, the defendant is charged with orchestrating each step of a brutal attack on the father of her child, from purchasing the sledgehammer used to strike the victim to drawing a map depicting the easiest entrance to his home office. Pamela Buckbinder is alleged to have played an integral role in this vicious assault, which were it not for concerned neighbors and responding NYPD officers could easily have turned fatal, end quote. Absolutely, man. Imagine had those people not come out of their apartments Jake Nolan probably would have continued trying to kill Michael, you know, to get the job done. Pamela's lawyers argued that the prosecution was grasping at straws and that they couldn't prove anything. They literally said, you can't prove anything. They said, there's no paper trail. There's no text messages or emails showing that Pamela 
discussed or conversed with Jake to help him plan this attack. And yeah, so what? The map is in Pamela's handwriting. She drew that map to help Jake take care of her son Calder. Jake was, you know, babysitting Calder and he would sometimes have to pick Calder up from Michael's or, you know, maybe pick something up from Michael concerning Calder so Jake would need to know how to get inside the building and into his apartment. They don't really ever address, like, why Pamela is buying the sledgehammer for Jake, but my personal opinion of this is that I think it's quite clear that Pamela did manipulate her cousin Jake into doing her bidding. But I also don't think that Jake is completely innocent of any responsibility, which is why I do believe it was a good thing that he served some time. But I would have had a real problem if Jacob Nolan went to prison and nothing had happened to Pamela and she'd never been arrested. She's clearly not a dumb person. She's a disturbed person, no doubt, but she's not dumb. She knew very well that Jake was going to do what she asked because he had a lot to be grateful for and he was indebted to her. You know, she had turned his life around when he'd been on a very bad path and she'd given him something to live for in being there for her and Calder. She'd given him a purpose. And as we see with many people who, you know, join cults, having a purpose can be a very powerful thing, especially when that person never really felt they fit in anywhere, never felt that they contributed productively to the world prior to this purpose being given to them. I think Pamela also knew that Jake would get caught. Like I said, she knew that there were surveillance cameras. She sent him there in the middle of the day when there'd be plenty of eyewitnesses around, including potential clients of Michael's since the attack happened during his office hours. So she knew that he would get caught. And when Jake got caught, Pamela knew she could just feign surprise. And she could tell the police, oh my God, you know, sadly, my cousin Jacob, he's a sweetheart doesn't have a mean bone in his body, but he's very mentally ill. He, he's not well. I promise you, I can prove it. I've been treating him. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a medical health professional. I've been treating him for X amount of months. And here are my notes, police, where he was having violent thoughts, violent episodes, where he was losing touch with reality. I didn't tell his parents. I didn't tell anybody because I really thought we were making progress. I really thought I could help him. I loved him. I probably shouldn't have been treating my cousin. You know, I loved him so much that I lost perspective on what I should have done. And that's my fault. I take responsibility. But listen, he was losing touch with reality and there was nothing I could do. I, I, I didn't think he would do this, you know? <laughs> like, that's just how I imagine things would have gone down had he been caught and arrested. And if he blamed her, she could have just been like, I don't know, he's, he's, not, he's not well. You know, he's imagining things. He has these delusions. He told me that Michael Weiss was sexually abusing Calder. He told me all these things. He was just having these delusions. Now, there's no mention of Pamela's mental health care with Jake, what it entailed, what medication he was on, what they talked about during therapy, things like that. But in my opinion, this is probably what she would have said. And in my opinion, I guarantee you that she premeditated it and she wrote things in her notes during their sessions to make it look like that Jake was getting worse and, and unraveling and imagining things and having delusions and hallucinations and things like that, you know? Pamela could then say, yes, you know, things were very contentious with my ex, Michael. And I often came home from court very upset about the way I was being treated by him. And, you know, I was very worried about Calder and how Calder would be feeling during all of this. And Jacob must have taken it all in and decided to take matters into his own hands. I never, ever would have told him to do this. I am a medical professional. I am a mental health professional. I'm a well-respected psychiatrist with several college degrees. My apartment smells of rich mahogany. You know, she would have opposed herself as this very responsible, well-meaning, intelligent adult and, and posed Jake as this just unhinged teenager who got too attached to Calder and to her and who, you know, went into like vigilante mode. And also, sadly, as a psychiatrist, Pamela would know that the general perception of people with mental health issues, especially bipolar disorder, is that they are unpredictable, sometimes unstable, and they can be, you know, one way one minute and a completely different way the next minute. And so I do believe that she took advantage of that stereotype, knowing that Jake would not be a super reliable witness against her, somebody who was viewed as well-respected, intelligent, and, and, you know, who helped people with mental illnesses get better. 
As far as Pamela was concerned, it was her word against his, and all anyone had was circumstantial evidence of her buying a sledgehammer, and she did not think that that would be enough to actually make an arrest, much less get a conviction in court. I also think that Pamela was banking on the fact that Jacob didn't look like the stereotypical mental health patient. From the outside, looking at Jacob Nolan, you'd have no indication that there was any sort of mental battle going on with him inside under the surface. He's young. You know, he comes from money. Uh, so he was always well-dressed, put together, groomed. He's attractive. When you look at, at Jacob Nolan, when he's walking into court, he's got tailored suits on. He's he's a cute kid. He looks like, like somebody who's just very um, affluent, somebody who has a lot of money, who knows how to dress, who knows how to present himself. And Pamela probably figured that the jury would either think Jacob was unwell and just put on his his Batman vigilante hat that day, or they would take one look at him and think, like, look at this kid. He looks completely fine and completely normal. He looks better than I look. And he must be lying about being mentally ill. He must be lying about being so mentally unwell that he was able to be manipulated and controlled in the way that he's claiming. But Pamela may also have not been considering the fact that she was the one who had a strong motive and that this strong motive came into play just days before the attack in the form of a $1.5 million life insurance policy that she was the one who insisted Michael take out and that Jake and his lawyers claimed to have no knowledge of. So Pamela was arrested in 2017, but it wasn't until the fall of 2022 that some movement happened in her case. On September 7, 2022, at the age of 52, Pamela Buckbinder pleaded guilty to her charges in order to avoid a potential 25-year prison sentence. So she, she basically took a plea deal. But then, in a twist, on October 11, 2022, she tried to withdraw her guilty plea, claiming that on that day that she had taken the plea, on September 7, she had not taken her medication. She'd also been high from secondhand smoke allegedly, according to Pamela, that the people in the holding facility and who were on the prison bus with her when she was being driven to the courthouse had been smoking synthetic marijuana. So the other prisoners, which I can just see her, man, like if you've ever seen Orange is the New Black, you know, when um, I think Piper, was her name Piper? When she first came in and she was like this little like East Coast rich bitch and she was like all like, I'm too good for these prison ladies like oh my god are you smoking drugs like oh my god is that a shiv you know piper was just so like scandalized by everything and (laughs) this is what pamela is doing like i'm just so scandalized by the synthetic marijuana that's being smoked on the prison transport bus to the courthouse and because of that secondhand smoke from the synthetic marijuana pamela buckbinder took a plea deal and admitted guilt when she did not mean to oh And uh, she also said that she got maced by the guards. Um, I don't think that she's ever gotten maced before because anybody who has gotten maced knows that you don't just get maced and then stroll into court and take, like, a guilty plea. You would be, like, swollen. Your eyes would be red. They'd be, like, swollen shut. There'd be tears running down your face. You would be a hot mess. And any person with eyes would be like, what the hell happened to you, man? Nobody would be like, oh, forget Pamela and her swollen eyes and, like, her the tears running down her face and like her swollen red face what's your plea lady they definitely would have noticed somebody would have noticed and uh justice thomas faber the, the the judge who heard her plea agreement he was like oh no pamela not today and he refused to let her withdraw her guilty plea he was like yo when i saw you on september 7th lady you appeared completely fine you appeared completely fine completely mace free and completely coherent the day that you made your plea and said that you were guilty and you admitted guilt to taking part in this murder plot so (laughs) pamela buckbinder did not get away with one more thing, and she was sentenced to 11 years in prison. But since Pamela had already been held at Rikers Island in East Elmhurst, New York, since her 2017 arrest, she'd already served five years of that 11-year sentence. And uh, after she gets out of prison, she'll also be serving five years of parole. Uh, She won't be able to practice medicine in the state of New York ever again. And as a resident of New York, I can say thank God for that 
It's already hard enough to find a therapist without having to worry that, you know, you got some Cracker Jacks person <laughs> sitting across from you on the couch giving you advice on how to, you know, tame your impulses when they're over here planning a murder with a sledgehammer of all things. So at the end of the day, it's very lucky that Michael Weiss survived this attack. It's very lucky because we have somebody in in this situation who's completely innocent of everything, and that is uh, the child, Calder. And now Calder is at least able to have uh, one parent who's there for him. I'm sure any relationship between Pamela and Calder will be strained for the rest of her life since she tried to have his father killed. So it's a good thing that Calder at least has, you know, his father with him. And, you know, in so many situations like this, usually the person will succeed in in killing their partner and then they go to prison. So the child has no parents, you know, because he has one parent who was killed and one parent who's now in prison for killing the other parent. At least Calder has his father who is with him. And I hope that once Jacob Nolan gets out, he also gets the help that he needs and stays on whatever treatment program works for him. That should include consistent therapy with a medical health professional who is not his cousin and who is not out of her damn mind. But what do you guys think about this case? Should Jacob Nolan have been found innocent? Should Pamela Buckbinder never have been charged since she didn't actually take part in the physical attack? You know, there's a lot of different opinions on this, a lot of varying degrees. I think if you're going to throw the book at Charles Manson and you're going to say, well, he's guilty for convincing his followers to commit commit murders, then you have to say the same thing about Pamela Buckbinder. And I also think if you're going to look at Charles Manson's followers, like Susan Atkins, who is an absolute psychopath, and say, well, you know, even though I do believe Charles Manson manipulated these people, I also believe that there was, you know, some choice involved at some point with his followers. And and we know that because one of them did like take off and, and didn't want to take part in the murder. So we know that they, they had some choice. So both parties needed to be held accountable. And I do think that it's good that Jacob Nolan was held accountable, but also that Pamela Buckbinder was held accountable. So let me know what you think about it in the comment section. And don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Share this video if you think it's worth sharing. Subscribe if you haven't already for more true crime videos like this one because a lot of you are watching but not subscribed. And if you subscribe, then you'll get notified when I post a video, hopefully, unless YouTube feels like... Uh, you know, hating me that week or that month, and they're just not notifying people. But I usually post in my community tab and let people know when I've posted a video because they do get notified of that. So yeah, make sure you're subscribed if you haven't already. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. The handles are in the description box. I also put links in the description box for the two series that I discussed and sort of referred to um, during this video. It was the Susan and Josh Powell case as well as the Andrew Cunan and the assassination of Gianni Versace case. I have linked both of those series in the description box. You'll also find a link in the description box for my coffee company, Criminal Coffee Company. Right now we have three different roasts. They are very, very good, all different, all subtle, all delicious. Check them out. I really think that you will love this coffee if you give it a shot. And I'm not just saying that because it's my brand. I'm saying that because I painstakingly tasted all a bunch of coffee and chose these three. So yeah, check out Criminal Coffee Company. So good. It's criminal. You'll find the link to that in the description box along with the link to our podcast, Crime Weekly, that Derek and I host every single week. We talk about different crimes that are happening. We usually do deep dives. We've also recently started a, a different series called Crime Weekly News where it's a shorter, more current crimes and more current cases that we're discussing in, in you know shorter videos and in only one part. So check that out. We are on YouTube as well as everywhere you get your audio podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I will see you very, very soon. Bye. Straight down And that river runs deep The mountains get steep And the voice is getting too loud Oh, this feelings are very It's looking like a cemetery They're going back from the grave Calling out my name Better say a Hail Mary Well, you don't know How deep it goes Until it's getting you slowly And so you got To let it go I 
got blood, blood on the strings. 